before we get started, does anyone want to get out? And here we go. Live from the Hollywood foothills of North Carolina, welcome to episode 84 of the Confirmed Epic Podcast, the official podcast of theepicreview.com and proudly presented to you by the Geeks Worldwide Radio Network. I am one of your hosts, The Real Brad Bell, and tonight I'm joined by not just a partner, but a friend, my great co-host, the one, the only, Jerry Reed, also known as Barbecue 17. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, folks, and thank you for clicking play. Thank you for downloading us on iTunes, clicking play on YouTube, SoundCloud, whether it's our feed or the Geeks Worldwide Radio Network feed. We appreciate you tuning in, giving us feedback. Thank you so much. Uh, And I hope we have enough gas to light the way for this late night podcast here. In case you (laughs) cannot figure it out, we're going to be reviewing the direct-to-DVD recent DC animated release, Gotham by Gaslight, which of course is an adaptation of a graphic novel, famously with art by Mike Magnola. Who uh, did? Who wrote that story, Jerry? I can't think off the top of my head. Do you know? It was Brian Augustine. Brian Augustine. Okay. Uh, did you reread the graphic novel? I did. Okay, so I didn't. I so reread much... my autographed copy of the graphic novel, autographed by Mike Magnola. Yeah, I had that autograph by him, too. Super nice guy, right, when he came to Heroes Con a very couple nice. years ago? Yeah, just very personable. He's been to Heroes Con here in Charlotte. Yeah, I've had a couple uh, a things cu- autographed by him. Yeah, yeah, he's very generous with his time. So uh, Mike's an awesome guy. If you ever get a chance to meet him, do it. Of course, the creator of BPRD and he- Hellboy, probably most famously. Uh, But, Jerry, before we get started with the show, I have some very special announcements and some uh, giveaways. Tell us, tell us, tell us more. Housekeeping? No, thank you. Sleeping. Housekeeping? Come back in an hour. Housekeeping, you want towels? I want towels. Need sleepy. Housekeeping, you want an info pillow? Please go away. Let me sleep for the love of God. Okay, first of all, many of you know that we have been selling shirts on T Public for uh, a couple months now. We've sold probably about 25 to 30 shirts on there. Some of that has been family, of course, but we've had a, a few fans pick those up, and uh, we greatly appreciate it. But. I've been working with uh, Joe Barhoom, who uh, created Geeks Worldwide and the editor-in-chief of Geeks Worldwide, Mr. Casey Walsh, on dropping a Geeks Worldwide coffee mug, t-shirt, and hoodie. And I'm proud to say that when this podcast hits iTunes, which will be uh, this coming Friday, I think it's the 20th, is it, is it the 20th this Friday? No, 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 that's not it. No, the uh, is Friday's this? the 16th. Okay, yeah, Friday the 16th. Black Panther uh, comes out, too. Yeah, absolutely. Go big see Black Dan, Panther in your new shirt. Yeah, big day in geekdom because Black Panther comes out. This podcast hits iTunes. Of course, we rec- record it live on Tuesday nights, and you can always tune in on YouTube. We tweet out the link. I'll tweet it out at the real Brad Bell. But for the first time, you're going to be able to get Geeks Worldwide merch. Those of you not familiar with their logo, it's pretty, it's pretty sleek. Uh, so stay tuned to tpublic.com slash user slash the real Brad Bell. And of course, we will tweet out the link. They will tweet out the link, and there'll be a link on geeksworldwide.com. Uh, so uh, look forward to that. Thanks for those guys for making uh, that happen. Greatly appreciate it. Okay, so before we get into the rest of the show, what we've been checking out in Epic News and then our featured review, I want to announce some giveaways. I'm going to give away two Superman comics. Uh, Superman number 37 and Superman number 38. This is part of the Sons of Tomorrow storyline. And, of course, this is by Tomasi and Gleason, who's been doing a great job with Superman since DC Rebirth began. I accidentally ordered two of these books, Jerry. Uh, so, uh, if you 
if you just tweet me, tweet me, Martha, hashtag Martha, at the real Brad Bell, D-R-E-E-L Brad Bell, are the first to email me at thepicreview at gmail.com, subject line Martha. That's all you got to do. I will send you these two comics. I'll send them to you for free. <laughs> Uh, a gift of the Confirmed Epic Podcast and the Geeks Worldwide Radio Network. I cover shipping. Uh, absolutely nothing to lose. Of course, hashtag Martha's Important Calls. Of course, it's uh, Clark's and Bruce's mother's name. And it's the real Brad Bell's mother's name. Uh, so we have that in common. All right. So now that that housekeeping... Cool. Are we autographing these like we autograph the uh, Transformers 2 DVD? If you want these autograph, we will. Uh, we could autograph. I could autograph one. Jerry could autograph the other. We could autograph both. If you just want them in pristine condition, I, I can draw could... mustaches on Superman. If you like that, if you yeah, Jer- Jerry notoriously is not the biggest Superman fan. No, no, no. I was gonna play off the uh, the Henry Cavill having the mustache in Justice League that they kind of removed. If you want to see what Superman looked like with a mustache, I'll make it happen. You could put white out on that, and it would be better than the CG that Warner Brothers ended up. Going I didn't with. even notice it. I'll be honest; I didn't notice it until everybody was talking about it after the movie. I had no idea. I was oblivious. I only noticed it on that first scene, like the cold open with the YouTube video, which I thought was a cool scene. But yeah. you can notice the mustache. I don't even that. remember. That. I mean, I remember that scene and liking it. I, I didn't even notice the mustache, but. Did you see the guy on YouTube who uh, took he, he compared he did a two shot so he had the opening scene from uh, Justice League where they CG'd off Cavill's mustache and then he did it with some footage that was released from uh, the new Mission Impossible movie Mission Impossible Six Fallout and he did a much better job like spending a couple hundred dollars just to stick it to Warner Brothers than Warner Brothers did on this billion dollar movie. But it didn't drive me crazy either, Jerry. Yeah, I'll be interested to see how it looks on Blu-ray. Yeah, when you're more close up on it, you're definitely going to be paying it or more Or will they attention. mess with it again? Ah, uh, that'd be that'd be something to see. This hits uh, Blu-ray, I think, March 13th, so that's coming up. I think it hit digital HD today. You can download it. <laughs> like on iTunes and stuff. Uh, but we're in the Stone Age, right, Jerry? We still do a lot of physical media. Yeah, I do physical media pretty much only. Okay, we got a big show tonight. Lots of collecting, lots of comics, lots of movie stuff. So let's go ahead and get into what we've been checking out this week. Sorry, that's our theme song. All right, Jerry okay. Reed, what have you been checking out this week? What have I been checking out this week? I have been... Check, checklist, check. Double check, check enough checklist, check. I finished, it is 500 pages. It's not a book. Well, it is a book. It's not a novel. It is, I'm opening it up. Batgirl, the Bronze Age Ominous, uh, Omnibus, Volume 1. Gosh, I butchered that. Batgirl, the Bronze Age Omnibus, Volume 1. And Jerry, obviously being the biggest Batgirl fan that I know, I'm interested to get your take on this. Sometimes it's a little difficult to go back and read these older age books. How was it? Did it read well? It, it does read really well. I, I enjoyed it. Um, so again, it, it's 500 pages, and, and one of the interesting things is this is this is the um, – well, it says Volume 1, which you know makes you assume there would be a Volume 2. Although, depending on, um, you know, what stories they're going for, I'm not sure what they would do with Volume 2. So this goes from Detective Comics um, number 359, the first appearance of Batgirl, the million-dollar debut of Batgirl, all the way until Batman Family number 11, um, May, or May, June of 1977. So it goes for about 10 years' worth of comics. You have a lot of Detective Comics appearances, because Batgirl typically had a backup feature in Detective Comics. You have um, just one or two issues of Batman, where she had a major appearance or a uh, backup story. And then you have most um, most of the issues from 1 to 11 of Batman Family, which didn't, didn't last very long. It was an oversized book, 
But it wasn't until the like nineteen seventy six or nineteen seventy seven. I think it's nineteen seventy seven where Batgirl actually has her own full feature in one of these books. Um, it's pretty pretty good though. You're right, Brad. It's, sometimes you're reading older comics, and you definitely have to kind of adjust to the reading of it. What is really fascinating with tracking a character though for for ten plus years now e- not every Batgirl story is included but there's I mean again five hundred pages worth there's quite a few Batgirl stories included um, appearance wise the book looks great I mean you know you've got a couple different uh, a couple different authors in there who are doing different work and you see Batgirl transition from sort of the the late sixties look throughout the seventies, you see the, you see the, um, you know, the, the outfits and the style change and stuff, but a lot of work by Carmen Infantino, those early days, um, obviously one of the most famous Batgirl artists and who did the cover for, uh, detective 359 in, in January 67. Uh, you've got a lot of Gil Kane in there. So Gil Kane's kind of one of the, the main earlier ones. Um, a lot of Don Heck, who does a lot of the 70s, the early 70s Batgirl work. And um, there's actually even a, um, a Denny O'Neill story, who was, you know, did a lot of stuff with Batman later on. But he actually did a uh, Detective Comics number 400 and 401. He did a Batgirl story as well. So, so what is uh, her kind of backstory when she's introduced in the Bronze Age? Because my first introduction to Batgirl was in the '66 show where she was a librarian, correct, she, Yvonne Craig? Yeah. Uh, so the um, you know the show really comes first. In all honesty, um, they wanted to bring somebody into the show to freshen up the third season. You know, there was an older Batgirl character, but it's not Barbara Gordon. And so they decided to bring uh, Barbara Gordon in to give Commissioner Gordon a daughter. So that that really largely is... Wait, wait, you mean she's not Alfred's niece? She is not Alfred's niece like in that film that was made in 1997 that was uh, Batman in name only. I'm going to call it Bino, I guess. Batman in name only. Um, My favorite part of that movie is when Batgirl's trying to crack the code to Alfred's computer that has all the top secret Pat, Batman stuff and information on it, and the code her, is Peg, like his old girlfriend. Yeah. Remember that? No, I don't. I, I've, I've, I've suppressed <laughs> those memories of Batman and Robin. Um, anyways, though, no, I mean, so she's a librarian. She's a PhD, uh, so she has a doctorate in library sciences, and she's Commissioner Gordon's da- uh, daughter, and she's heading to a costume party. She's heading to a costume party for, I think, like a uh, Gotham City Policeman's Ball. And she sees um, a-, a plot by the killer moth. And so she's in a Batgirl costume. She has made this costume, basically a, a female version of Batman, for the costume party. And she sees somebody in trouble, and she jumps out to rescue this person, and she sort of realizes she's pretty good at this. I mean, she's proficient in martial arts, she's intelligent, and she decides to take on the role of Batgirl. So here's an interesting thing. Through this series, up until 1977 when this book ends, even when this when this uh, omnibus ends in 77 – Apparently Bruce Wayne does still not still does not know that Barbara Gordon is Batgirl. He must not have been the world's greatest detective in this um, era, Batman. She does not know who who, uh, who that Bruce is Batman. She she learns her and Dick both finally discover that they're they're um they're bat they're Batgirl and Robin when she is a congress a congresswoman she runs for congress in the story and she's a congresswoman through in the mid 70s and so uh, this is actually one of the best parts of the series here is what's interesting in the early batgirl stories i mean obviously there's a, there's a lot of elements where she's a competent superhero but there's also clearly a lot of times where robin or batman say all right, time to go home, Batgirl. This is man's work, or you know, something that's very looking back on it is 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 clearly very sexist. 
But as this as the series continues on, you start to see her take on this um, this you know this element of uh, like a, a feminist character and a, a woman's lib character. And so it gets very interesting. I mean, she starts getting involved in, like, all of these political things. Um, you see her, like, interacting with the counterculture movement. A lot of the, you know, a lot of, like, the domestic terrorist bombings that happened in the early 70s, you know, where she's involved in investigating these kind of cases to the point where she runs for Congress and wins. And so she's That's a very empowering story for that era of politics. Very interesting. There is a great there is a great opening by Gail Simone who talks about, you know, again, how the character made such an impression on her, who Gail Simone, who's famously written, uh, written, wrote, you know, wrote Batgirl and and was involved with the, the New 52 series. But um it's funny to see it go from kind of this, you know, okay, Batgirl, let's let the guys take over now, to the point where she is, I mean, just completely her own character, and rarely, if ever, interacts with Batman. A lot of interaction with Robin, but she's much older than Robin in these books, which is interesting. If you read anything now, you know, it seems like Dick and Barbara have always been about the same age. You yeah, know, in any yeah, of the books the and stuff, but in these ones, she is clearly much older because you know Dick is like early in college, and she is you know a congress. Yeah, she's a congresswoman. <laughs> so it, it's a really fun series if you enjoy the Batgirl character. Um, the early stories can be harder to read. I mean, they're definitely sort of very silly at times. Um, again, there is one story just just to kind of get you where some of these go. So there's one story where, you know, Batgirl shows up to help Batman and Robin and something, uh, her mask gets misadjusted and gets, her mask goes out of place. And so she, she's focusing on, you know, getting her mask straightened back up and the criminals get away and Batman's kind of like, you know, well, that's just your, you know, your womanly instincts. Uh, oh my god! You know, and so then like there's another one where they're having a fight in a swamp, and she shows up to help, and somebody throws mud at her, and she's like, "I can't fight until I get this mud off my costume or something." Well, that's the times. Have you oh. ever tried to go back and watch something like Rudolph? It's extremely sexist. Something yeah. as innocent as a child's Christmas TV special. So many lines about this is man's work and what. Yeah, I mean, this is just a product of the time. Absolutely, it not, it's not but, right. But, but here's where it gets. Here's where it's funny. So the third, the third one is she shows up and she says, "Oh, I have a run in my tights." And she puts her leg up on a log, and she says, hold on, I have to fix my tights. Of course, all of the criminals stop and are like, oh my gosh, check out those gams. And they're all, like, freezing up looking at her, and suddenly, like, Batman and Robin just come in and start pummeling the criminals. And she's planned this whole thing. So it's very interesting, and then you start getting to where, oh wait, she's a congresswoman, and she runs for Congress, and you get to see the character become, you know, very serious and very well written, and um, a detective in her own right. One of the craziest stories, I, I kid you not, now this is again one of the things that sometimes makes some of these older ones weird. Now this is after the, the she's a congresswoman at this point. And that's typically where I think this series gets better. Um, the ghost of Benedict Arnold is brought back from the grave by apparently Satan and is trying to destroy the United States by allowing Benedict Arnold to attack those who defend the U.S., who are symbols of U.S. freedom and justice. So he's trying to destroy Batgirl and Robin. Yeah, they could at least use Etrigan the demon instead of Satan. It's crazy. I mean, they don't liter they don't say Satan, but they call him Old Scratch at one point, which is one of those you know sort of folksy colloquial names for yeah. for Satan. Um, yeah, sometimes there's some really strange stories in here. There's a really cool story though where she meets up with the original Batwoman, 
And so she's talking, and she's been wondering if she should change her name from Batgirl to Batwoman. Some people are asking her, and the original Batwoman gives her the blessing, but after they work together, Bat Batgirl says, nope, that's your title. I'm going to keep my title. So that's cool. kind of interesting. Uh How's, so this is obviously a newer release. This since just Nelson came Mon out at the end of last year. Intro. Okay. okay. Very How's new. the quality of the omnibus? Is it good, heavy paper stock it is and stuff? Very, it is very heavy. It's very nice. Um, I think the colors look great. All the pa There was about one or two pages that I thought looked less than super clear. There was like one page. I mean, it was still obviously very readable, but maybe it was something where a really good copy just didn't exist. But um, well, the thing is, DC with the gold, silver, and bronze has really got back into the omnibuy game because they for so long did the uh, absolute editions, yes. which are phenomenal, which are big, oversized, usually with slip covers. And they were sewn binding, but Omnibus is a little different. You usually got more issues in there. It's more of a, it's bigger than a regular comic, but not as big yeah. as those absolutes. Like Kristen, your wife has the absolute Sandman. Yeah, definitely. I have absolute Kingdom Come, so they are a little different. So it's good to hear that DC's Omnibuses are pretty good. Hey, real quick, Batgirl question for okay. you. Okay. And uh, I know you're the expert, and it has something to do kind of with Gotham by Gaslight. It totally does. I, I know exactly the question you're going to ask. Okay, so how come in some incarnations of Batman, Jim Gordon, yeah, he's the father of Barbara Gordon, that's his daughter, but in other incarnations, Barbara is his wife. Like, what is the reasoning behind that? Is it is it Barbara's his wife name, his wife's name, and his daughter's name? I just never got that, and I'm a big Batman fan. Yep. So in the earlier ones, yep, she is the daughter of Commissioner Gordon, and there's never really much um, there's never really much said about anybody else. I mean, she is the daughter of of Commissioner Gordon. So what happens? is at some point she becomes his adopted niece who he raises as a daughter and barbara is also um his wife's name and his is his wife dead in some incarnations or are they just i know they divorced like in uh batman year one because he was having an affair yeah so um I remember that so in post-crisis stuff Barbara Gordon is Jim's wife, and Barbara is also their daughter because there's James Jr. and then there's Barbara. So they named both of the kids after them. There is a story Which where is really weird. Well, I mean, it's to say, I guess you know. Again, um, some of this maybe comes from Batman Year One because they use B Barbara is. Um, the, you know jim's wife's name in year one yeah and where some of this comes from and i guess maybe folks had to kind of kind of stick to that continuity um at some point but there are there are there are times where she was portrayed as being his niece too and so that can and, become a little bit uh, confusing in, in pre Jr. in pre-crisis in pre-crisis stuff, Barbara is Gordon's biological daughter. In post-crisis, she's typically adopted, but it gets confusing later on. Rebirth seems to establish, uh, I think even New 52 seems to go back and say that Barbara is Jim's actual, but in New 52, she is his actual daughter again. Yeah, and uh, James Jr. it becomes a psycho killer, and that's a big. That was how kind of Scott Snyder got yes. on the scene with Batman in that Detective Comics Black Mirror storyline. So he plays a big role. Yes, in and even more um, recent Batman even stuff. even uh, you know, Batgirl's mother plays a big role in the new Fifty Two Batgirl series. Like she shows back up. She apparently left because. As a kid, James was so weird and was doing, like, violent stuff and had threatened to, um, gosh, like, one of, 
one of Batgirl's friends like went missing as a kid and they think maybe he had something to do with it and apparently he had threatened her at some point and so she left yeah some of that stuff with him gets kind of dark but let's go from dc to marvel with what i've been checking out uh, I've been checking out Marvel 2-in-1. So Marvel fa- has famously pushed the Fantastic Four kind of to the back of the catalog, even though they were the first Marvel comic, the first family of Marvels, they always have been called. And since Fox has the, had the movie rights, and this is, of course, before Disney obtained Fox, or it looks like they're going to obtain Fox unless Comcast screws that up. I mean, they have been kind of out of the picture, especially... Mr. Fantastic and Sue Storm and we've had there was even Johnny Storm the Human Torch was like on the Inhumans which sucked and Ben Grimm was with the Guardians which was crazy Uh, but this gets kind of back to basics it puts together for the first time in a long time uh, Ben Grimm the Thing and Johnny Storm the Human Torch it is written by Chip Zdarsky Uh, with art by Jim Chung, who is a big artist, did a lot of Hulk stuff in the mid to late 2000s. Uh, I really am a fan of his art. Uh, Chip Zdarsky has done stuff like Howard the Duck, and I've just never been a big fan of him because he's like over-the-top comedic. So when I saw he was writing this, I thought maybe this would undermine this moment. This should be a big, heavy, sentimental moment, the Fantastic Four uh, kind of, I guess, reuniting, reemerging. I mean, this first story is called The Fate of the Four. Uh, but I think that Chip did a good job. He showed that he could handle serious writing. There's a lot of emotional uh, beats. Uh, ben Grimm gets, finally gets the uh, Fantastic Four headquarters, the Baxter building back. That had been the head of Parker Industries for the past, like, four and a half years in Marvel Comics. That has went bankrupt. If you followed Spider-Man, you kind of know what happened with that. But it, it's really cool to see these two reunite. And uh, there was a message that uh, Mr. Fantastic Reed Richards had left him in the event of his death. And he, uh, Ben just always refused to watch it. But he was kind of inspired to watch it after a talk with Spider-Man and getting the Baxter building back in his possession and it's basically, hey, go explore, right? Go do what we did. And he finds Johnny, and that's kind of where the book ends. But when Fantastic Four is out at its best, it is one of the top Marvel titles. Maybe not selling, but usually from a storytelling mm-hmm. perspective. You got to remember, so much of the Marvel lore spun out of Fantastic Four. I mean, Black Bolt and the Inhumans, the Silver Surfer, Galactus, just so many elements of... Uh, Marvel Comics that have defined that company came out of Fantastic Four. So their their absence has been felt. So it's really good to see Marvel at least embracing half of the four. And I think inevitably with them getting the film rights back, it's only a matter of time uh, before we get the Fantastic Four uh, back full-time. So Jerry... Uh, have you ever been a big fan for fan? I don't think a lot of people are today. I think, I mean, probably the biggest Fantastic Four fan I've ever been was maybe back during the, this going to sound crazy, back during the early 90s. I mean, was probably the time I was the most in the Fantastic Four. And it was because of um the, the Toy Biz toy line. Remember the old famous, yeah, yeah, yeah. famous line and, and yeah. stuff. Yeah, the, the the Toy Biz uh, Marvel superheroes line. I mean, at that point, you know, a lot of the characters were very, very classic Marvel characters, and so I would read whatever comics I could get a hold of, or whatever trading cards I could get a hold of to to learn about the characters. I mean, that was probably the time I cared the most about the Fantastic Four. So there, I mean, I definitely am aware of the Fantastic Four. I've read. You know, I've read some of the the older stuff. I mean, I've read some of the the definitely some of the early Marvel stuff with the Fantastic Four, but they're they're definitely not on the highest part of my list of favorite characters. Yeah, and that's and that's you know that's earned from you because you've been keeping up with comics to a certain extent, are aware of both Marvel and DC your entire life. 
But I don't feel like a lot of the modern comic fans who came in, let's say, due to the MCU, something like Avengers or the first Iron Man, well, that's, have really been given that's, a chance. Yeah, I, I think you're right there. That's been pretty intentional that those characters have been... I mean, we've we've sort of we've sort of seen that happen, and you know, again, whether it's been official or unofficial, we've seen you know license licensor uh, licensees, you know, even not releasing like for a long time, Hasbro was not releasing a lot of X Men product. Oh yeah. I mean, there've been multiple movies, X Men movies that Hasbro did not support in any way with a toy line. I mean, which is crazy. I mean, what superhero movie doesn't, you know, big Marvel movie doesn't have a toy line? And uh, we've seen the same things happen with Fantastic Four. I mean, it's a big deal right now that Walgreens has those exclusive Fantastic Four figures that Mr. Fantastic is coming out, Invisible Woman is hit, uh, Fant- uh, Human Torch is, is just starting to really get out there. So I will say I have read Secret Wars. I have read Secret Wars and I've read Secret Wars too. Uh, I read those big Marvel omnibi, and so so I, I definitely have have had some of the interaction with the '80s versions of the characters too. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens uh, moving forward. Uh, so, Jerry, I think that's gonna do it for what we've been checking out. Is there anything you wanted to mention before we moved into epic news? I can't think of much that I wanted to mention before we. Uh... We move in epic news, so... I'll throw one thing out there really quick. Just a quick shout-out to Old Man Hawkeye. It is written by uh, the guy's name, I believe, is Michael Sachs. He, this is a relative unknown in Marvel, not a big name at all. And Old Man Hawkeye takes place in the same kind of pocket universe that Old Man Logan did. And uh, it is just a whole lot of fun just seeing a lot of those elements from Old Man Logan carry over. Uh, But at this point, Hawkeye is kind of estranged from his daughter. And he's getting toward the end of a little bit of spoilers for uh, Old Man Hawkeye number one. He's getting toward the end of his life. He's going blind. And it's only going to be a month to a month and a half until his sight is completely gone. So he's starting to miss targets, which you know for a character like not Hawkeye. So, a character named Hawkeye is not something you'd, you'd expect. Yeah, so you can imagine how hard this is on him. And uh, so he's also trying to make up for lost time with his daughter, who, you know, since he did all this Avengers work his entire career, it it really kind of messed his family dynamic up. He ended up uh, divorced from his wife, not spending any time with his daughter. She resents him for it. And this just has a real interesting way at realistically looking how this could impact the family dynamic, being an Avenger, right? Because you have all these gods and superhumans, and you have billionaire playboys like Tony Stark, uh, maybe it's more understandable to the people around them that they're gone. But, you know, Hawkeye Clint Barton, somewhat of an average guy, right? He always kind of feels outmatched when you, even you see Jeremy Renner playing in the Avengers movies. But there's something kind of cool about that. And just to see how this, all these superhero antics have affected his personal life throughout the years. It's just really fascinating stuff. There's a lot of uh, action the multiple man uh, had, I think, Madrix. I can't remember the guy's first name who's the multiple man from X-Men. But he actually has come in contact with the Venom symbiote. So this looks like okay. it's going to be fun. It's going to be a 12-issue limited miniseries. Uh, so give that a shot. We got a ton of epic news, Jerry. So let's go ahead and get into that. Big news from Warner Brothers and DC. Uh, it was announced and rumored that DC was going to be doing standalone films outside of the DCEU a couple months ago. And one of the first films rumored was a standalone Joker movie in which DiCaprio was being courted by Martin Scorsese, who was going to produce with Todd Phillips, the Hangover director. That's what I was thinking. I was uh, thinking uh, the first thing that came to my mind was uh, old school. So. Yeah, yeah, take, and, and old school, taking, which is a great movie. Uh, taking the hymns behind the scenes. Uh, apparently, they couldn't get DiCaprio, 
but they're very, very close to getting Joaquin Phoenix to play the Joker in this DC standalone movie. This going to be, I guess, similar to The Dark Knight, as in it will be more of a crime drama thriller than it will be a superhero movie. So the Joker, always big shoes to fill. Uh, when you talk about Nicholson, Heath Ledger, I don't think Jared Leto, he wasn't terrible, but he didn't quite live up to that. He didn't have a lot Jared, of time either. Let's Yes, let's be honest. He, he, uh, was, Joaquin, a, he was a you know supporting part of that film. But Joaquin Phoenix is a he's in the upper tier of actors. I mean, he's one of the best of the best going right now. He is on Heath Ledger level as far as ability is concerned. Uh, what do you think about Joaquin Phoenix potentially playing the Joker? Good fit? Would you like to see this? Jerry? I would like to see it. I think it's a I think it's a good fit. I mean, he's Joaquin Phoenix has a lot of range. He's he's done a diverse you know diverse uh, number of roles. So. I, I could see him pulling something, you know, pulling something out that's pretty unique, pretty different than what we've seen. Yeah, of course, everybody's familiar with Walk the Line, but if you have the time or just look up a clip on YouTube of his performance in the movie The Master alongside Philip Seymour Hoffman, in which he is one of the first people in the country to embrace Scientology. He is kind of a off the cuff, I wouldn't say manic or anything like that, but uh, definitely a kind of an out there character in that film. Uh, and I think that kind of gives you a hint of to what his Joker may be like. He can choose scenery, but not like taking your attention away from the scene. He does it in a very yeah. subtle way. You want, and that's something that's difficult to do. If you want sometimes. an out there uh, Joaquin Phoenix uh, reference that, that actually ties into a Joker reference, remember when he was on the David Letterman show that one time? Oh, yeah. I'm still here. Yeah, but this was like before we even knew what that was. And <laughs> yeah. he didn't He didn't seem like they, they – I think David Letterman said like, well, Joaquin, we missed having you or something. Yeah. Uh, Remember that in The Dark Knight Returns, the Joker goes on the David Endocrine show, which is clearly a parody of David Letterman. So, I wish we could see a scene like that. Who knows what movie. we'll get? Who knows what we'll yeah. get? I was thinking All like right. they could do his flashback if he's like sitting there and, you know, the Joker has to he has to think about his whole life before he commits a crime. You know, Kind of like he'd walk the yeah. line. He has to think about his whole yeah. life before he yeah. performs. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> He's in Arkham instead of Folsom Prison. Yeah. <laughs> Throws a glass of water <laughs> at somebody. It's like it's acid. He just scars the. Person. Oh, that'd be um, pretty sweet. So, uh, sticking with we DC should write this movies. movie, Brad. We should. We should. I think we should send a pitch over to Todd Phillips. If it was going to be in the DCEU, I know whatever we could come up with would be better than what they could come Wonder up Brothers, with. Wonder Brothers, if you if you send us a, a tweet that says Joker, we will send you a script for a, a Joker movie. Yeah, we'll write it down on a napkin, and it'll be a lot better than anything set in the DCEU, probably. So, uh, or a lot more... A lot more thought will have went into it. <laughs> we'll say that. A lot more knowledge of character. Uh, let's stick with DC and Warner Brothers. So Warner Brothers is apparently on Michael Bay to direct a standalone Jeez. Lobo film. Uh, Lobo's out there. He's like a, a time-traveling biker. Uh, what species is Lobo? Isn't he some kind of alien, Jerry? You know more about him than me. Yeah, I mean, Lobo's a, Lobo's an alien bounty... He's an alien bounty hunter. Um, I mean, he was originally a villain. So that's, that's kind of the first thing to think about is he was a villain that when he got into... When we got into the 90s and everybody um, started becoming villains... Or sorry, when when anti heroes and bad boys kind of got popular, uh, they sort of turned him around and made him a anti hero. So um, he's a oh gosh, Z Zarnian, I think he's he's a Zarnian. Oh, that's right. I know he's a yeah. I know he's a, a mercenary bounty hunter. He's currently part of the Detective Comics team. That's and I'm sorry, he's part of the Justice League of America currently. So, and I, he's a cool character, but I don't know about him carrying a standalone movie. He's a, I think he's a cool character when he shows up and, and has something like really weird to do or, you know, as part of a team and you kind of rein him in a little bit. Um, yeah, again, I'm not sure what I think about him as a, 
you know, and actually being in like a full movie. I, I've definitely seen some people talk about this, and and like a lot of people said, I mean, Lobo is is if you look at his character design, he is clearly that early '90s comic mentality, you know. Lots of pouches on that. Yeah, yeah. Vest. He's kind of like, I mean, he's he's oversized. He's got big hair. He's got glasses. He he cusses. He smokes. You know, he's got a big dog named Dog. But uh, he, chains and a motorcycle. I mean, geez, you know, this guy is like clearly out of early '90s comics. And maybe there is no better director for this movie than Michael Bay. Um, yeah, the directing choice fits. Interestingly enough, Bay says he wants to cut the budget, which is something he never wants to do. So, I, I don't One know. One good thing about this, Jerry, it means Michael Bay is not making more Transformers movies. He, he, you know, he, he's, he's got to do something on the weekends. I mean... <laughs> What if Lobo crossed over into the Transformers oh franchise? Gosh. He becomes a, uh, tra- a Autobot bounty hunter, which they already had in like Transformers Four. I, I think, mean, there, so. there's got to, you know, sometimes you try to think about these things and are like, why, why in the world would DC be trying to push Lobo right now? Like, why would they try uh, to push nah, Lobo? They have not got Justice League. Here's right, the reason. Dude. Here's the reason. Deadpool. Deadpool is another one of those characters that comes out of about the same time period, same style as Lobo. He's he's almost a parody of that over the top, uh, you know, comic hero of the early '90s. And Deadpool was a runaway success. I mean, people who did not even care about the Deadpool character really loved that movie. And this seems to be DC warner's attempt at having a similar character and having a you know a comedy vulgar r-rated uh superhero movie still but being able to tie it into the dc universe they're too reactionary we've talked about this on many podcasts in the past they need to focus on themselves focus on getting the core elements of their most important heroes right like they did with wonder woman yeah and go from there. Not try to chase Marvel at every turn. This has to stop. It's clear. It's clear that we need a Metal Men movie. That's what they have to do. Give us a film of the Metal Men. That's what we need. I can see it now. Like Whenever the MCU is going to announce its first X-Men movie, they're going to, a week later, announce... They're Doom Patrol and doing a Doom Patrol. Doom Patrol. <laughs> I would love to see them do Doom Patrol. Doom Patrol would have been my second choice. I want to see like the Grant Morrison Doom Patrol. I don't want to see this crazy batshit Gerard Way Doom Patrol. I want I mean, it's okay, I, I, but yeah, Grant Morrison Doom Patrol would be okay. Yeah, I, I like I like the Gerard Way Doom Patrol. Um, it's very interesting. Now again, I, I definitely like the the older Doom Patrol. Give me Robot Man. Give me Negative Man. Although Negative Man is pretty awesome in the Gerard Way version as well. And I love I love the main character. I wish I remember her name offhand. Since she's new, I have a hard time remembering her. I can see her in my head back in. Yeah, she's like an ambulance driver, which is really cool. Yeah, I yeah. really liked her character. Honestly, last year I was looking at her costume. I'm like. Could I do like a, you know, there's all the, all kinds of, you know, people always doing like a gender swap versions. I'm like, I could, I could pull that off. That's cool. Looking. Oh, in 2017, 2018, Jerry, you could definitely pull that off. No, man, I mean, with the outfit, I'm like, I like that I know, outfit. It looks I know, pretty I slick, know. you know, so, but. All uh, right, we were just mo- talking about Transformers, so let's go from one 80s property to another. And this it. is one that's near and dear to your heart, Jerry Reed. Uh, so, there had been a Masters of the Universe film scheduled for a December 19, 2018 release, which I had forgotten about. Once I read this story, I remembered hearing about it. David S. Goyer, who wrote a lot of stuff uh, for with Nolan in the first, at least Batman Begins, and worked a tad on The Dark Knight, I believe, and has done a lot for DC, wrote a lot on Smallville, Smallville excuse me, was brought in to... Um, direct masters of the universe even though he's typically a writer but now he's stepped away from the project and they do not have a director jerry as the biggest masters of the universe fan that i know and one of the biggest out there period what do you think Wait, of this did, did you say i'm the biggest masters of the universe fan out there period no, no, I said one of. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I thought I know there's you, more. I know you, there's uh, more. yeah, you, you, uh, you, you cut out for a second on my feed. 
So yeah, no, I know there's bigger yeah. fans than you. Well, but, I mean, you're a pretty damn big. I fan am of this putting franchise. out a Masters of the Universe film on December nineteenth, twenty eighteen, and we'll see whose movie gets made first. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. They have been going back and forth on this Masters of the Universe movie. And this just seems like one of those projects that has been stuck in development hell for years. And I mean, well over a decade at this point, there's a, there, there's a guy. And I mean, I mean, I mean, no disrespect here, but there's a dude that, um, has like done his own masters of the universe movie in terms of, he has his, um, Oh crap, Brad, what do you call them when you make like comic panels, storyboarding? Yeah, Thank you, Brad, so. for helping. Storyboarding. You, you There's a guy it. on, like, <laughs> He-Man.org that storyboarded, like, a whole Masters of the Universe trilogy and stuff and, like, you know, where various 80s music kicks in. And I think that guy is going to get his movie made before Warner Brothers gets their movie made because um, – Warner Brothers, right? If this was Disney, if they had this property, it would already be a comic book with Marvel. Oh, we'd have a. And beautiful. it would be a streaming. It would be planned for a streaming series on their new. Who's service trying to put this out? out? Sony. I'm sorry, Sony Pictures. Yeah. Um, oh, it's Sony. So Warner's doesn't have. Masters. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's Sony Pictures. I mean, I I think the issue is now. Here is the thing: there really is a Masters of the Universe piece of entertainment coming out here very soon. There is a She-Ra cartoon. That is coming to net. I think Netflix. Really? Yes, this is coming to Netflix. You know, Netflix has had a lot of success in doing. I mean, their original stuff. A lot of success with their own cartoons. And She-Ra: The Princess of Power is coming soon. Um, Noel Stevenson. She does like Lumberjanes and Oh yeah, uh, Nimona. But they're they're coming out again. It's going to be its own thing, which I'm super excited about. I mean, my daughter's middle name is Adora, so I'm a... And that's adorable. Adorable. So yeah. I, I'm a huge I'm a huge fan of She-Ra. I love the original series. It's, it's very fun. She-Ra has never sort of had that reimagining like Masters has had a few times. But going back to it, again, Masters of the Universe, I think the biggest issue is they're going to have to figure out... And maybe this is why they're having so many problems. What tone do you take with that property? Not only tone, backstory, yeah. because there's so many different kind there, of spins there's multiple on it, versions. Just from but to you. I mean, do you do you try something like an epic fantasy action adventure movie with magic elements? Yes. Do you go for something crazy and over the top? Um, do you try to go like sci-fi time travelish, which is sort of what they tried to do with the uh, the Dolph Lundgren film, which I, I love, I, I do like that movie. I think the first like 30 minutes of it and then the last 20 minutes are pretty good. Masters of the Universe, uh, like are, are a pretty good Masters of the Universe movie. It gets weird in the middle because they have to come to Earth, which is apparently probably a budget reason. But um, I, I mean, honestly, I think it's true. They, 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 they got their budget slashed pretty heavily in that film and the decision was, well, we, we go to Earth then. That way you don't have to have all kinds of crazy sets. You can film in a town. But I, I think there's clearly other movies that have done that as well. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. as a way to cut out a, a lot of budget things. I, I don't know. I mean, this this property just seems like it – you know, there's a Masters of the Universe episode of, of The Toys That Made Us. And it's a, it's a really good episode. I have to watch this show. I, I feel like Masters of the Universe, as much as there's still stuff for like fans and collectors going on, I, I'm almost afraid it's a property that belongs so much to a specific period in time that it may be really hard to recreate. I'm No, don't say that, Jerry. That makes me sad hearing you say no, that. But, I, but I'm just saying, I, I think it's one of those things that's almost a you had to be there. But I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful to see how they handle the new She-Ra series, and if maybe that sort of gives um, you know, a, a new direction for this property to go in. Because this has there been any new comics? Because uh, like on one of the first four or five episodes, yeah. I read that six issue miniseries that was kind of like a a origin or like would serve for like what would be the first movie probably in a trilogy 
Uh, and that was really good, and I got introduced to so many of those characters, and ha- ha- did anything ever come of that? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it did It did last a while, and I, I think it's still, uh, they, they did a crossover with Thundercats that just ended in, in March of last year. Um, I remember seeing that in Solicits. Yeah, I mean, I think that ended last year. The, uh, the ongoing series was called Eternity War, and it, it lasted in twenty six uh till twenty sixteen. So I mean they did a they did a few years worth of comics. A- again, uh, the issue was a lot of people thought the comics were way over you know there were folks who thought the comics were too serious, too over the top than what they remembered. And then there were people who liked kind of that, you know, crazier uh, more violent, you know, more swords and sorcery rather than, you know, Saturday morning cartoon feel of the series. And I think that's one of the issues is Masters of the Universe has – the fans of that, even the the 80s, have two very different opinions of what Masters of the Universe should look like. Yeah, I remember I enjoyed that comic. I mean, I had you as a guide, though, to help me get through it and fill in a lot of the gaps. So I might have been lost with some points. Otherwise, if I remember right, DC was putting out that book. Were they the ones that kept putting it out through 2016? Yeah, D- DC continued to put that book out until the uh, until the Thundercats crossover ended. I wish IDW would get Masters of the Universe comic book license. I, they would do I, wonders. I have with that. said that for years. I think IDW is. I don't know of another company that handles these '80s properties better. Their Turtles book was incredible. Their work on GI Joe has been absolutely fantastic. Um, I, I feel like IDW is probably a small enough company that they don't have to sell massive amounts to keep a book going but i feel that they respect the property and they while they do new things with their properties they also they also feel like they're enough of fans that they they keep the original feel and the original tone i would love to see idw get the masters of the universe license boom studios as well they've really done wonders they're doing the power, power rangers, rangers right license. and and it has yeah and it's been as somebody it's like my dream come true like the stuff they're doing with those power ranger books is like what i wanted a power rangers like new trilogy of movies to be they got the tone perfectly mixed so you mm-hmm. got some of the outlandishness and cheesiness of the 90s show but it has stakes there's something you hadn't heard me say on this it's podcast stakes. for a while it is uh it feels like a blockbuster level film and it, it gets really dark at points and it plays with multiple timelines and it 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 adds mythos that you never knew that you wanted with yeah. Power Rangers or maybe you always wanted so I'd like to see maybe them take a stab at it but I, do you know who has the comic book license now does DC still have it or did it lapse I I, I actually don't know at this point. Yeah, okay, last question, Jerry. Yes or no, does this movie happen within the next decade? Oh, within the next decade? Oh, it, yeah. it definitely happens within the next decade. Okay, I hope you're right. I want to see this movie, and I'll definitely go see it first weekend, opening weekend uh, with you. Okay, Jerry, did you get a chance to check out the Venom trailer this week? I did not. Well, you didn't miss much. It was rather boring. And it doesn't and have it Venom in it, correct? Yeah, yeah. If it did not say Venom uh, on the title card at the end of the trailer, I would have thought this was like a the Jack Ryan reboot or something. <laughs> like, I mean, it, it couldn't Jack look any more, which they are doing on Amazon starring John Krasinski. Oh, again? And I say that. Yeah, and it looks really, really good. It's just, a show. They it's not a movie. Jack Ryan movies a couple years ago with Chris Pine. Yeah, that was the movies. This show though is okay. supposed to be like prestige television. So I actually want to watch it. But but anyway, prestige, um, it just looks really dull. It looks not. I guess it doesn't look super heroic at all. It looks very militaristic, which I'm sure that's that's what they're going mm-hmm. for. Um, it's supposed to be, it is Eddie Brock, and Eddie Brock became a veteran who lost his, uh, his legs, 
uh, in some of the later Spider-Man comics, and he actually fused with the symbiote and worked as Venom with the Special Ops military group. Yes, this did happen, Jerry. And it was actually pretty good in the comics for three and a half, three years or so. Yeah. But apparently, they're just starting out at that point with Tom Hardy Venom. Is this poster like, the so. one that is the poster the one that has the white eyes? Now the poster is badass for a studio. The poster, poster is really cool. That the, the, the just says just, just says Tom Hardy Venom. Yeah, yeah. That's kind of cool. I, I like the poster. And I, and I posted that on our Instagram feed at Confirmed Epic Podcast, and I posted it on the site th. Yeah, Epic I saw that too. on there. Yeah, pretty pretty cool. It is cool. So, uh, Venom's uh, another one of those totally '90s characters, isn't he? Uh, yeah, uh, he's hard to get right. I'm gonna tell you, they haven't done it yet. I'm gonna tell you a true story. You ready? Yeah. I yeah. had a Venom tank top in the early yeah. '90s. Did you say we are Venom? No, but uh, on. I only ever owned one tank top in my life, and it was this Venom tank top. Yeah. And so sometimes I would want to go outside and, and play Street Fighter. And so I like, like you know, Guile wore a tank top. So that was my go-to tank top when I wanted to pretend I was playing Street Fighter. Yeah. That really happened. So, true story. True story. I would take the uh, the player's manual out for Street Fighter 2 <laughs> and try to, try to pretend to do the moves. Yeah. I was teaching myself you know. uh, martial arts that way. You know I don't have a strong opinion on a story if I go to Andrew Stokes quotes. So yeah, um, really happy. Speaking of nineties, we've talked about Lobo. We talked about Venom. Well, you don't have uh, a strong opinion on my story. I mean, it, you know, I, I I took broomsticks and pretended it was Lord Zed's staff. So okay. I mean, what do you want me that's to say? That's ridiculous, Jerry? Brad. I mean, that's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't even repeat that on the internet. My, okay, so uh, my friend uh, had a pool. And uh, we had always play like Power Rangers and stuff in his pool. And above his pool, he had a uh, a, a deck overlooking the pool. So like when Power Rangers was really big, you know, uh, when Rita would like throw her wand down and stuff to make the mustard grow, one of us would stand up like on the um, on the top of the deck, and one of us would be like on the side of the pool. And somebody would like throw the broom down like it was the wand. Then one of us would jump into the pool <laughs> and, and, and imitate the monster. So yeah, that Make that's my the kind of stuff. Grow! Yeah, that's the kind of stuff I did, Jerry. Awesome. So I don't know if I can really like you know bash you for taking the Street Fighter manual out into the street. I still like, know how to do a flash kick, so you know, don't mess oh, with me. Man. It's just crazy stuff when you're when you're a kid. Yeah. Um, it's good times though. You keep those memories. Um, so but let's go to Wolverine. So Wolverine's been dead since 2014. Old man Logan's been around, but completely different character, Jerry. Uh, and Charles Soule killed off Wolverine in the four part Death of Wolverine series in 2014. But there's been a lot of hints at his return. He appeared in the Marvel Legacy one shot a few months ago. Uh, and he's been popping up as far as sightings go in Marvel books here and there. But he's coming back full swing, the original Wolverine, this May. And it's going to take place, Jerry, over, get this, four four-part miniseries. All right, not a four-part miniseries, but four different four-part stories that are so they're going to need. Yeah, so 16 issues plus a one shot before Are that. Are they trying to outdo Hunt. DC with the multiple Justice Leagues? <laughs> I guess. So <laughs> there's a one shot called The Hunt for Wolverine. So you're talking 17 issues for Wolverine's return. I don't know. It starts in May. I, I don't think it's all one month. And they all have holographic but covers. I bet I bet there's there's got to be some kind of gimmick, right? Like they've always, um, and I actually wrote this up at Geeks Worldwide today. I hadn't done a news story for them in a long time, but they needed somebody to post it, so I wrote it up real quick. So you can check that out at dgww.com. You know they always throw Wolverine and oversaturate you with him, mm -hmm. and he's in every book and this, that, and the other. But man, they, like they couldn't wait to do that here, could they? It's like right away. Here's, 
you haven't seen Wolverine, so here's 17 Wolverine books. It's like, okay, damn it. You know, it's like I a, hate a you. a year and a half worth of Wolverine books. Yeah, in, in two weeks. Um, to, no, to be honest, like we get about weeks. 17 Batman books every three months, too, so... Yeah, but I'm probably I will read this. This is one that I'm sure they're gonna collect in like a big hardcover trade. Oh, absolutely. Uh, so I'm just gonna trade weight that because there's no way I'm paying four bucks, five bucks a pop for all those. I may pick up like the the one shot, the hunt for Wolverine, but I'm not reading like all sixteen of those books as they they come out. What do you think about that, Jerry? Isn't that overkill, man? Yeah, I mean it's a lot. That's a lot of Wolverine books. I mean Wolverine's a he's a huge character. If there's a yeah, if there's a Marvel character. If they haven't sold, if they haven't had Wolverine out for a while, then I mean, he can handle that many books. We'll see. I mean if it's four separate stories, then I don't know. I mean I guess they have different characters in them and different storylines. I mean again if. <sighs> One of them's like involving the X Men. One of them's involving like the Avengers and how they're reacting to it. And I forgot what. I mean, for a major event, for a major event, that doesn't seem like crazy overkill to me. No, it doesn't. It's just when you, I think back in the day when these were coming out, and I were buying them, when I was buying them, and you were even buying single issues. Like I guess I didn't just I didn't think about it as much. I just got excited. I didn't think, oh my god, this is seventeen issues. Yeah. So I mean, again, I I'm thinking like eh, if that's like one or two trades, that's not that bad. So, I mean, I'm thinking like yeah. something like Flashpoint had, you know, all of the multiple Flashpoint stories and stuff like that, and that was a sm- I mean, I thought that was a smaller major event you know but the impact was the huge, impact though. was huge but in terms of like how many issues you had to you know you were reading or something it, it didn't feel as big as like some of them that have come out all right jerry let's hit some collecting stuff real quick here we're not gonna harp on it too much because next week's all about toy, toy fair, fair. That's coming all soon we're, we're already starting to see about. some stuff leak out yeah, and one of the things that leaked out this week was, and it's our best look at this to date, not just as for a toy, but for the uh, this in general, uh, Hasbro's Infinity Gauntlet prop replica leaked with light and sound. Uh, did you get a chance to see this, Jerry? I put I, the picture out there. It's pretty cool. Uh, what What'd you think of it? It looked really nice. It's very nice. It did, like, it had the light and sound, but I don't think that, from the video that I saw, I don't think that cheapened it in any way. It looked prop it's replica cool, uh, worthy. It's a cool, cool little extra. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not like your best of the best prop le- replica, you know, but it for something that Hasbro's putting out, it, it, it's, it's really good. So it's something that I think will be sought after when Thanos blows up this summer and, and becomes extremely popular. Um... But, Jerry, it kind of got me thinking. I want to pose this question to you. I have my answer. Uh, if you could have one prop replica from any movie, comic, TV-related item with this level of detail, what would it be? Do you have anything in mind? Gosh. I'll tell you mine. Tell me yours. Tell yours. me yours. Mine is... Do you think you can guess mine? Uh, Yours is... Spider-Man 2's The Train that he stops. No, I love no. that. The, uh, no, it, I'll give you a hint. It's Power Rangers. Dragon Dagger. Really? No, they've made that. Uh, Saba. Cl- you're close. They've made that, too. Kimberly. This is one thing. <laughs> they have not made. They can't replicate her to okay. be serious. I don't know. <laughs> it It is the Sword of Darkness that the oh, Green, the Green Ranger, Ranger had. Sword. Okay. Yeah, that he had in the original miniseries, and that's the only time it appeared. And it's just a badass Japanese sword, because of course it came from the Super Sentai series, and they just brought it into the American series, and that is what kept the spell uh, on Tommy, making him the evil Green Ranger. It's something they never sold a, uh, sold a toy of. Uh, the only two times it was included as an accessory was in the SH Figure Arts Green Ranger, yeah, and in the, they did have and it in there. the Marvel, and in the Marvel Legacy Green Ranger that came out like two years or so ago. Uh, so that I would love to see them to do the prop replica of that in the Legacy line, like they uh, did for uh, the Red Ranger sword that just came out. Like I would, 
I would buy that. Like, the, there's a handful of things that's like, yeah, I don't buy Hot Toys anymore. Yeah, I don't pick up prop replicas. But, you know, there's a handful of things that it wouldn't matter. I would still get it. And um, that would be one of them. Because I've had the Dragon Dagger, you yeah. know? I've, I've never had that. So that would be mine. Do you have any? Gosh. Can, if not, you can think about it and tell us that we... Yeah, next I may, week I may never think about that. Episode. I'm not I'm not sure. Okay, so think about that. Uh, speaking of Toy Fair, we got our first look at the Mezco Sovereign Knight Hold Batman. on, you, you were just talking about Marvel stuff. Something new just popped up today. Okay, okay. what is that? So they're getting ready to... Hasbro's getting ready to release. It's going to be called uh, Marvel Studios The First Ten Years. They're going to be doing a uh, Marvel Legends assortment of, of Marvel Legends figures that oh, cool. that are various characters. Uh, you know, again from the first ten years, um, they've announced three new ones today. The first one is a two pack. It's um, a Chris Evans Captain America from Civil War, but with with a Frank Grillo crossbones from Civil War as well. Oh wow! It's a really good. Both of them are really nice looking figures. They're gonna, these two are going to be Walmart exclusives in a two pack. Um, looks like they're jumping the price up on things a little bit. They're forty nine ninety nine for a two pack, which is about ten dollars more than you would typically expect for a two pack. So, so that's jumped up a little bit. And then they have a single Iron Man, which is the Mark Seven, I think. Uh, like that's what he had in uh, Avengers. Was the Mark Seven? Okay, the, the, yeah, this is the Avengers Mark Seven Iron Man um, after the fully loaded rapid deployment Mark Seven suit or whatever it's called. Uh, that's going to be a Walmart exclusive as well. That's the one where he's falling out of the building after confronting Loki. Then the suit just comes to him. Yep. Yeah. So, and then there's I, there's there's uh, supposedly a, a, a Captain America First Avenger figure of some character. We don't know who it's going to be. A Thor Dark World, and then probably another Infinity War exclusive that's going to be for Walmart as well. That's a good idea. And the, are these again? These aren't repaints, right? I mean, these are new figures. These look these look completely new. These look very new. Um, I mean, the, I'm looking at the Iron Man now on thefoosh.com, and he looks really Crossbones good. Crossbones is awesome looking. I, I really am tempted for that just because the character looks so cool. Yeah. Um, that is a good incarnation of that character, the Frank Grillo version from the movies. Uh Man, you know, speaking of the the first 10 years and leading up to Infinity War, I mean, everybody seems to be celebrating Marvel at the beginning of 2018. I know a lot of podcasts on Geeks Worldwide are even going back through every movie. Uh, so one thing I pitched to Jerry is not every movie, but going and revisiting at least Avengers and Avengers Age of Ultron. And maybe Iron Man 2, since that was like the prequel it was. to uh, Avengers. It totally was. So, we, that may be something that we look in uh, doing on the podcast between now and May 4th. Dolph Lundgren's so, uh, Punisher, a tribute. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the build-up to Infinity War. <laughs> uh, the Spider-Man but, where uh, he rides a motorcycle, the tribute. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mesco Sovereign Knight Batman, Jerry. So this is the second uh, in the line of uh, the the Batman so good. line, I guess, that they're doing. Yeah. So they're trying to cover different eras in Batman's crime-fighting career. You had Ascending Knight, which is early Batman, Mesco's take on early exactly. Batman. And this is kind of more next-level Batman. So the way I wrote it up on Action Figure Barbecue and Epic Review is, if Ascending Knight's Batman begins, this would be more Dark Knight. Yeah, the, Batman as far as the era. Yeah, they're uh, Batman. Me- Mezco's. I think a Mez- Mezco's like official description of it is, th- this is Batman in his prime. I mean, this is when you're common. You know, when you're reading pretty much any Batman story, this is a this is a standard classic batman and so if yeah ascending knight is supposed to be like their in their words like this is their version of year one this is their standard classic batman and we're gonna talk so much mesco next week absolutely i just wanted to throw this out there because it is a cool looking theater you can check it out at actionfigurebarbecue.com and the epicreview.com and uh, I'm really excited about it. You know, it looks like a blend of, uh, you know, you were saying, Jerry, what, what were you saying it looked like a blend of to I, I, you? The New 52 definitely looks a lot like the New 52 Batman, um, which is a great costume. I still love it. 
And then sort of the uh, the Ben Affleck suit as well, though. I'm seeing a lot. And of... I thought there was a little Arkham. Yes. Batman. Yeah. Suit throw some in Arkham in there, well. especially for the gauntlets and the boots. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, which are some of my really favorite bat cool suits looking. overall. So looks really good. And, and you'll be pre-ordering this, I imagine, Absolutely. whenever the pre-order hits, BigBadToyStore.com. But uh, again, next week, episode 85, the topic is Toy Fair 2018, so look for, I mean, we'll do a few, you know, news stories if there's something big, but really, other than what we've been checking out, it's nothing but Toy Fair. But Jerry, speaking of Batman, let's go ahead and get into this week's featured review, which is Gotham by Gaslight. in this town preying on poor women and the Gotham police stand twiddling their thumbs your evening attire sir that was not the suit I need Alfred I mean to rid Gotham of the Ripper he's a skilled hunter and he's just getting started you're studying me you're a fascinating subject I'm not just another pretty face. Bruce Wayne, you are under arrest. You can't imagine I'm actually the Ripper. The deluxe suite. I need to get out of here. Gotham needs the Batman. Every moment puts women in danger. street now jerry let's get into a few stats for gotham by gaslight before we kick off give us some stats This was released on home video February 6, 2018. Of course, we mentioned it's based on the graphic novel uh, by Mike Magnola and written by who, Jerry? Brian Augustine? Augustine? Yeah. Augustine? And that that came out in uh, 1989. It was uh, directed by Sam Wu. It was scored by Frederick Weidman. It is the 30th direct-to-home video DC animated film. That's crazy to think about that. That is crazy. It is Bruce Greenwood is voicing Batman here, so you don't get the Kevin Conro- Conroy, but Bruce Greenwood's pretty decent. Wait, it was Bruce Greenwood? Yeah. Huh. Uh, that's different than my copy. Are you sure? Mine I says mean, Lee look- Greenwood, because every now and then, Batman sings God Bless America again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm proud to be in a... You know, my grandma's a huge Lee Greenwood fan, and we actually, Lee Greenwood, for years, and you're from Tennessee, so you yeah. know this, he had a, uh, in Pigeon Forge, he had a, a permanent place he would do concerts. He did. And uh, we took my grandparents up there twice, I think, uh, during my lifetime, and that was a real treat for them. So, uh, shout out to Lee Greenwood. Uh, now, this movie is a rated R, pretty pretty unique for one of these direct to now a couple of these have uh but was uh, uh assault on arkham rated r i can't remember i think it was i haven't seen that one i bought that it when i bought good. this one justice league yeah, dark Best... was rated r yeah and I, I have that one um assault on arkham was on sale for like nine bucks when i bought yeah, that was this a good one, one so too. i just went ahead and pick that up yeah this is 80 percent on rotten tomatoes which is really good uh, for one of these direct-to-DVD films. And uh, if those of you who are not familiar with um, this story, it's basically Batman hunting or tr- attempting to hunt down Jack the Ripper in what I guess would best be described as Victorian Gotham. Yeah. Uh, so we're talking late 1880s. 1889, I believe, because the Jack the Ripper murders were 1888. Yeah, yeah, they they were right before the turn of the century there. So, um, uh, very cool premise that the book pitched, and 
Uh, the movie does some interesting things with that. So, Jerry, uh, let's start with a few opening questions here. Are you a fan of the original graphic novel, and what are your thoughts on this concept as a whole? You seem to like yeah, it. Yeah, th- this is one of my favorite. So, first of all, I love Elseworlds. DC Elseworlds are some of my favorite Batman stories. Um, and some, I mean, just stories I, I generally really like. This is this is this is the first DC Elseworlds title. Um, before they were even really calling them Elseworlds, this was the title that th- there were there was a history of DC of doing these stories that they would come out and call imaginary stories. Usually they were something pretty strange or silly. You know, what if Superman like you know Mary Lois Lane and became a clown or something something stupid like that. Wait a minute. What about Batman Fortunate Son? Okay, well that's not Elseworlds. That's that's its own thing that should be best <laughs> that should Elseworld. best be forgotten. But um <laughs> okay. the, I mean of the Elseworlds stories and I have read quite a few of them. I mean this this is still one of my favorites. The fit is so awesome and um I mean again this idea that what if the White Chapel murders make their way over to Gotham City with a Batman who is just beginning his career. Um, you know, it plays on a number of things. Again, I mean, you have that classic... I mean, obviously, everybody always wanted Sherlock Holmes. You know, there's there's plenty of books and movies where Sherlock Holmes tracks down Jack the Ripper. Well, if you have Batman as the world's greatest detective, it just makes sense that you'd want to have Batman try to, you know, solve this these infamous murders it gives Batman that opportunity to do so. Um, If you have the whole thing about, well, how would you, how would people, you know, react to, to Batman showing up kind of this fearsome visage around the city, especially during the, you know, the, the, um, the 1880s, this, this movie, uh, or sorry, this story sort of, you know, shows how people would react to that, that fearsome imagery in their city. So, really cool idea i I really like the story i will say this is one of the first when i got back into batman comics when i got back into comics in general this is one of the first batman titles that i read because there was a there was something i had found that was like people ranking the you know the the 10 15 20 best batman titles Number one was Batman Fortune. So. Yeah, number one was probably Batman Year One or Dark Knight Returns, but this was in the top five or top ten, and so it really intrigued me, and I have I have loved it ever since. Jerry, can I pitch you an idea? Absolutely. For a confirmed crap podcast, can we review Batman Fortune at Sun one day? Absolutely. Let's review Batman Fortune at Sun. <laughs> Batman Fortunate Son is one of the strangest Batman titles I have ever read. I mean, it reads like it reads like an early '90s comic, which is okay. But then it also reads like a like a chick tract or um like an after school special about the evils of rock and roll music. It is so strange. I save it for okay. Okay, it's weird. Let's let's move on. All right, so no, I dig this book too. Uh, Mike Magnola's art just feel it, it fits this time. Yeah, period. it creates an aesthetic that's just unique. It and, just um, oozes style. Yeah, it does, and and it it's one of those perfect pairings of time period and and artist, and uh, it, it it's just a really cool concept. Like I I absolutely love the graphic novel and. You know, you don't often see DC characters deal with real world issues in some of the way that Marvel characters do. So to see Batman, you know, in this world of Jack the Ripper, right? Uh, Jack the Ripper murders were these were real. What? These were real murders, right? Jack the Ripper. Yeah. Yes, I mean, I mean, there's a least. Yeah. Uh, there's there's typically so okay. Uh, quick, quick. I mean, I was like ninety nine percent on that. But quick, just, quick I, I segue. I heard you laugh. So one of my favorite. This sounds weird. Um, a few years ago, I read Alan Alan Morris from Hell. I don't know if you've ever read that. I have not. It read is it. incredible. I know it, it is after all of this research and time and effort put into it. 
Alan Moore wrote this book about the Jack the Murder Rippers. It was turned into a movie that starred Johnny Depp um, in the maybe late 90s, early 2000s. I think it was the late 90s. It's, it's, it's okay, but this book is incredible. I mean, he put so much time and research into it. Um, even though the book is a little bit speculative about things that may have happened, and there's some very metaphysical things that go on in conspiracies, but his facts in the book about what happened are are just absolutely, like, he backs them up and shows where he gets these ideas from. I mean, this was a real thing. There were at least five murders that are considered to be authentic Jack the Ripper murders, and then there were at least maybe like six to 11 more that police didn't know if they, they connected or not. So this was a, this was a real thing. Yeah. Yes. And it's cool to see DC characters deal in real world elements because that's more Marvel usually. So when DC does it, it, it usually plays well, but they don't do it as often. Uh, so I think that's a cool concept. Uh, so, are you a fan of these direct to DC animated films? Do you have a favorite, maybe? I I have a couple that I um really like. I really like the Wonder Woman movie. I love yeah. the Wonder Woman Wonder Woman movie that they did a few years ago. I really like Justice League: The New Frontier. Oh my God, it's so good! I love that one. Too. Yeah, those are those are both really good. Um, I liked Justice League Dark. You let me borrow that one, and I really enjoy that one as well. I will say that I really enjoyed the Dark Knight Returns Part One and Part Two, where they had Peter Weller. Oh, that was voice that was very Batman good. And Michael Emerson voicing the Joker, yeah. and we talked about that before on one of those earlier confirmed epic podcasts. Uh, if you have not watched that, I mean, it's more of a faithful adaptation of the source material than this is. Yes, that Gaslight. is very much a faithful adaptation. This is something different. Yeah, and we're about to get Not into bad, that, but... just different. Yeah, All right, they do some cool stuff here. They so do. Uh, let's go ahead and get into that. Uh, obviously, this is different than the graphic novel, even though it's been a while since I've read it. I mean, it was uh, immediately noticeable. Oh, this is crazy um, different. Yeah, and I think some of it's in a good way. What were your initial impressions of this and just how it was different from the graphic novel? Did you enjoy this, Jerry? I I did enjoy it. I enjoyed it quite a bit. Um, It was it was cool getting a different story. If you know, if you, I don't know how much we want to talk about the original the the graphic novel, but in the story, and again, it's it's very short. When I say graphic novel, this this came out more as like a. I guess what you call a prestige format originally, which was yeah, so probably about like a double sized issue that was, you know, done a little bit, a little bit nicer, you know, usually a uh, soft. Cover. Those were big in the 80s. Yeah, the big early 80s, 90s. early 90s. You don't see a lot of them. Uh, the um, the Dead Man series that was done a year or so ago was actually a premium for uh, prestige format as well. But anyways, this was um, I really liked it. It was very different, and it had been a while since I read it that as I was watching it, I'm like, this is really cool. I just don't remember any of this stuff happening. Like, I don't remember these <laughs> characters in here, and I went back, and I'm like, yep, because they're not in here. Um, this is completely different. I mean, honestly, the only things that I feel they really translated over from the comic to the movie – Batman's look is the same. They they capture which is a cool it's look. A so they great didn't look. need to change that. One of my ten favorite Bat costumes is the Gotham by Gaslight look for Batman. Um, they took the same premise that Jack the Ripper is in Gotham, or that excuse me that there is a criminal in Gotham who is attacking women and prostitutes. Because they don't even play on the whole Jack the Ripper thing too much in this one. And that's a huge part of the book. Yeah. This takes I mean, place th- in the 1880s. And that's about it. That is literally yeah. about all this book has in – all the movie has in common with the book. 
Yeah, and like, I mean, this is extreme when you talk about the treatment of women. They say whore a lot yeah. in this movie, and it's one of the the big story elements of this movie is that Jack the Ripper's purpose is to take out the filth of Gotham, and he's targeting women here. And uh, the women that he's targeting are uh, women that we know, especially in the beginning, it is uh, Poison Ivy. Or they just call her Ivy in this, Yeah, Pamela right? Isley. I mean, they call her Miss Isley yeah. at one point. And she's a uh, like a burlesque performer, in a sense. It seems to be. Maybe that's uh, maybe not quite what she was doing. But she was doing a routine that, you know, she had lots of, like, vines and leaves and stuff and motif in her costume. And she's killed within the first five minutes of the movie. Yeah. It's, it's pretty violent. Um I mean, you mentioned earlier this is rated R, and so I mean it's not like insanely. <laughs> you're not you're not talking like any kind of like a horror movie or anything, but and there's not f bombs or anything like but that. But again, either. I I think it's like when you're watching something that has a cartoon styling that especially that looks similar to other you know DC animated things, you're sort of taken aback for a second when you know, somebody gets stabbed and there's like a lot of blood and you're like, Oh my gosh, I kind of forgot what I was watching. So yeah, because people get stabbed in cartoons, but you never see blood. And then when it's rated R, you're like, Oh my gosh, this is uh jarring a little yeah. bit. Uh, even though that's what would happen. I imagine but... the R rating is, is, is probably due to some of the, again, like you said, the, the language that's used as, as people are discussing, I mean, prostitutes being murdered uh, or some of them is prostitutes, some of them are not. And and then, again, because it's a cartoon, I imagine DC's probably trying to be as cautious as they can so somebody doesn't pick it up and be like, oh, it's Batman, the kids will love it, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's... I I don't know if this needs an R rate, no. Do you not think it could have passed for PG-13? Uh, again, I, I think DC was trying to be cautious and they didn't want to have anything where somebody picked it up inadvertently and said, wait a minute, this is the same rating as Justice League. I mean, imagine taking your kids to see Justice League, which, again, you know, there's there's punching and kicking and, and whatnot. And then saying, oh, here's Batman Gotham by Gaslight. It's also PG-13. And suddenly you have a lot of language that, you know, are using very unflattering terms to talk about women and you have people being like sadistically murdered so i'm chuckling because warner brothers would like to imagine people taking their kids to see justice yeah oh uh -huh. so <laughs> you know but I, I didn't hate that movie so, i said that i liked last it week. too okay. but, uh -huh, so what do you think about uh greenwood as batman here i think he's been batman and some other stuff um, i really liked him i thought he did uh i thought he did a good job as both uh you know, both Bruce and Batman, and sometimes I'm, you know, sometimes I'm never sure about, um, some people I don't think always, you know, do as good of a job as going back and forth. You always want Conroy. You see an animated <sighs> Batman, you expect Conroy's voice to come out of the guy's yeah. know, mouth, but... And but it it wasn't like off putting. He was very the word I would describe Bruce Greenwood here is he is very ser serviceable yes. in this role. I uh, and I liked him. He was also I, I probably Batman liked under him the more Red as Hood. Bruce than I did Batman. But I, I I thought he did well. He's he's been um he's been Batman in Under the Red Hood, which is another one of the DC films animated movies, and he was the Batman in Young Justice. Yeah, yeah, and if you uh, actually see Bruce Greenwood, he's a character actor. Like he's a legitimate actor mm -hmm. who's in a lot of stuff. You will a very recognizable guy, uh, and and he did he did fairly uh, well here. Did you like the animation style? Obviously, that Mike Mignola art is just so iconic. Yeah. Uh, would you have liked to seen more them try to imitate that more, or are you happy with what they did here? I liked what they did. There were definitely times when I thought things looked a little plain. Some of the back, some of the backdrops were a little more Spartan than I would have liked, and I thought maybe trying to match some of the color palette of the of the graphic novel better, or. Um, maybe even more use of shadows than they did. They did. A, I mean, yeah. it looks good. It's pretty good. I mean, I, I didn't have many complaints about it, 
but I definitely thought how they could have given it a, just a little bit more character even, you know, make things feel a little bit more sinister. It felt like a bland color palette somewhat, and a lot of that's just trying the, the time period they're trying to replicate. Color here. hadn't really been invented yet, so. Yeah, yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, but, uh, <laughs> I, you know, they were trying to get that kind of slummy Victorian England, you know, turn of the century look, and they they did okay with it. But it's just, I, I'm kind of glad they did their own thing than trying to replicate Mike Magnolia because that style is just so so iconic. That, that would have been uh, really tough, it, but um, yeah, you know that that have you ever seen the Hellboy animated movies? They're really good. Yeah. they do a really good job of that. Yeah, they're good. It's like the sword. There's something sword, and then there's another one. There were two of them that came out around. There's the time blood. There's Hellboy blood and iron. Blood and iron, and then there's the one about Elizabeth Bathory, the Blood Queen. Yeah, they're they're decent. I own them on yeah. Blu-ray, I think. Uh, so yeah, check those out. Sword of well. Storms and Blood and Iron. All right, Jerry, I'm going to roll the spoiler reel forward here. Before we do that, would you recommend this uh, movie to people? I definitely would. I mean, I, I still think it's an interesting concept, and that's really what this movie – I mean, that's really what this movie does is it, it takes the concept from Gotham by Gaslight and runs with it in a different direction than the original novel. Um, even if you've read it, I mean, I don't think it's going to be one of those where someone who's read this is going to be – terribly upset that they didn't adapt the comic perfectly i wasn't terribly upset that they didn't adapt it a little baffled at times that they didn't use some of the plot elements but i think i think it's still pretty enjoyable i mean again it still has that you know that sort of old-timey feel that sort of sinisterness that comes from a lot of these like you know the sherlock holmes films about Jack the Ripper or uh, From Hell, you know, it captures that feel where you still have the Batman element as well. If you're a Batman fanatic like Jerry and I are, go out and buy this. It's worth owning, add into your collection. If you're just a fan of the original story, uh, it's different, but it's still, I think it's worth owning just as a take on that story. Uh, but if you're just a average comic book fan who likes superheroes and are not as not as invested in Batman, I would wait till this hits Netflix or something. Uh, I'm, we'll rate it here after the spoiler reel. But yeah, I would recommend it. Watching it, I don't know about owning it. But with that being said, Jerry Reed, let's go ahead and roll the reel forward to spoilers for Batman Gotham by Gaslight starting now. So spoilers starting now for Gotham by Gaslight. Uh, Jerry. Yeah. Uh, let's get to the big reveal here, and then we'll kind of work our way backwards into some of the smaller stuff before we wrap this up. Jim Gordon is Jack the Ripper. Did this shock you? Because it did me. That It, it really surprised me. I, I thought it was going to be – I honestly did not know it was going to be Gordon – until there's a scene where where Batman is investigating Gordon's home, and he starts finding all the weird stuff. And even at that point, I thought, well, they're going to show that he's involved in you know criminology and studying these things, and he's ahead of his time, and you know this is a red herring. And nope, he is Jack the Ripper, and has a very strange reason for the murders that he commits. Yeah, I think he finds just women, women, excuse me, uh, disgusting, and they were bringing a lot of the filth into Goth Gotham, and not just people who were in these burlesque shows like Pamela Osley was, but like the typical homemakers. Yeah, and uh, obviously his views are very extreme, but it ultimately leads to a really cool scene, a climax between Jim Gordon and Batman, who have this showdown at the Gotham's World's Fair. That's an element in a lot of Batman stories. I mean, that, that shows up in Mask of the Phantasm. I think it's called something different, but same concept yeah. there. Uh, and they have a really cool final showdown like on this Ferris wheel, which is supposed to be one of the, up until that point, biggest Ferris wheels built in the world. And you have Selena Kyle caught in the middle there. And uh, I just, I really dug that scene. And it ends with Gordon committing suicide. Uh, before Batman can save him. So, um, 
I really dug the ending and at least the showdown. Did you enjoy that? I did. The final scene in this movie is really well done. I think it's interesting when you have a fight scene that's animated between two characters that can be as dynamic and exciting as, you know, a big budget Hollywood special effects fight scene where you can't tell what's going on. Um, This one was very clear. It's very easy to understand what was happening during the fight and to understand kind of the motivations and and feel what was going on between, you know, uh, Batman and and Gordon during this fight. So that really made it for a a nice climax for the story that is a nice mixture of story and set pieces. You know, it's not one action scene over the other. They they did a really good job of pacing this movie. It's not yeah. long either. I want to say this is... An hour and 17 yeah, minutes. Yeah, I was going to say it's about 70 or 80 minutes. It's not very long at all. Yeah, and uh, it, it is very well paced. And I don't care what the, the incarnation or the story is. When you see Jim Gordon and Batman fighting, there's just something that's kind of jaw-dropping about I, I that really, if you're a Batman fan. I, I have to say, I really found it very odd that they chose to turn Jim Gordon into Jack the Ripper. That is the part to me that doesn't quite gel. I'm not sure that they set it up well. It seemed more like it was for shock value. It seems like it was more for shock value. Um, uh, Real quick, I want to, you know, the, 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 the Jack the Ripper killer in Gotham by Gaslight is named Jacob Packer. He's a character that's introduced in, in the story at the beginning that he is coming back from London at the same time as 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 Bruce. Um, the way these stories are set up is very different. This movie, correct me if I'm wrong, Brad. Does this movie make any reference to to the Jack the Ripper killings in London? No, it does not. So that is a huge part of what happens in Gotham by Gaslight. That sort of like Batman Year One or Batman Begins. That Bruce has been traveling the world. They, they, he's he's met with Doctor Sigmund, Sigmund Freud and has had you know conversations with him. Um, he has met with Sherlock Holmes. It's implied, which this movie implies it at one point too. Um, he's gone around the world and met like the best of the best in psychology and criminology and all these things. He's been gone from Gotham for five years, and he's just coming back from. You know, he goes back to London quickly, and then he heads back towards Gotham to start doing whatever it is that he's going to do. On board the ship, he meets Jacob Packer, who's an old family friend of the Waynes, and he's a lawyer, and he's coming back from time spent in London as well. So Bruce gets back. um, He starts becoming the Batman, and people start realizing, you know, okay, something creepy is happening. You know, this 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 winged character is showing up in the skies. But then what else happens is the Jack the Ripper murders start happening in Gotham. That these things were happening in London, and now they're happening in Gotham. And pre- giving it much more real world stakes yes. in the graphic. So novel. pretty quickly, what everybody realizes like is Bruce Wayne has just came from London. He cannot account for his nights, and they decide that he is um, he is Jack the Ripper. He's put on trial. He's convicted. Jacob Packer, who again the old family friend, a lawyer that his father used. Um, tries to defend Bruce, it doesn't happen. Bruce is going to be hung. He goes over and over and over every file that Gordon can get him. Gordon is on his side. And what he finally realizes is the knife that's been used in these murders is the same knife. It bears a symbol that was part of a medical group his father was a part of. That's when he finally connects it, that it's got to be somebody affiliated there and it would be jacob packer he finds out that jacob packer um was was a failure early in life that thomas wayne took him under his wing that jacob developed an affinity for martha martha spurned him 
and Jacob, and she kind of laughed when she did, in his opinion. And so he's always had this hatred against women, which that is a big part of the Jack the Ripper murders. A lot of the theories and and whatnot, you know, always connect back to why did this murderer target women? Why did he target prostitutes? Why did he target people who were lower class? That story has it as he always saw Martha Wayne and everybody to the point that he even paid somebody to have the Waynes murdered. So he is a longtime enemy of Bruce, and he never knows it. And he sees framing Bruce and putting Bruce's ja Bruce in jail as part of his um, final plan to rid the world of, of Martha Wayne. That's a much more involved story. It is a much obviously. more involved story. What this story does is actually add more characters in, although I would argue that the, the Jack the Ripper aspect of Gordon's character doesn't make a whole lot of sense, or it doesn't tie into the story as nicely as Gotham by Gaslight, the, the book, does. I think this does a good job of world-building Batman or or transforming the Batman mythos or universe, if you will, to uh, that time period. And it does this best through the characters, like how the Robins are introduced. There's a group of orphans who are doing petty crime, and uh, Bruce Wayne interacts with them, and they have an interaction with Alfred, and they turn away from that. And the nickname of their street gang is the Robins, and, you know, it's it's Tim, it's... It's Jason, it's Dick, right? Yeah. So, obviously, a tie to the the Robins and Batman. Uh, did you like that nod? I did. I, I really like that part. That the, you know, Again, these, these little nods where you're taking characters. I really like the fact that they took uh, Leslie Tompkins, you know, the doctor friend of the Waynes, who's always been a longtime um, ally of Bruce, and they turn her into... Uh, mother Leslie Tompkins that she's a nun who is involved in like an orphanage and so she has helped to raise a lot of these orphan children including Bruce and so that was a really cool way of sort of adding a personal element to things I, I do feel at times and I mean maybe it's it's hard for me to look at this from an outsider opinion I, I do feel like to understand some of the connections to these characters that um I guess understand some of these connections to these characters that you would have to know who these characters were in their regular DC roles as well. Like to understand the significance of Leslie Tompkins in that role, it feels to me like you may have to have some familiarity with the character in regular DC comics. I'm not sure if that's just me looking back on that or not, but there's a lot of these. Um, there's one, there's actually one connection, though, that the novel, or the graphic novel has, that the movie doesn't. And what's that? The Joker. Yeah, and I'd forgotten about that when, until I went yeah, back and looked back at the When Bruce goes to talk novel. to, um, and I think that's kind of an interesting red herring, because as you're reading that book, you keep expecting the Joker to show up and be the Jack, be Jack the Ripper. And he's, I mean, he's totally not. He never, he never appears other than Gordon making a, a reference to a guy who tried to poison himself with his own chemicals and it did something to him. Yeah. And you know, while the added characters from the Batman mythos, weaving them into this story, uh, that does reward Batman fans like you and I. I don't know how much that means to your average viewer watching this. Probably not much at all. Yeah. And some of it almost comes across as like, really, you needed to put Bullock in here. Uh, you needed to put... I mean, the Ivy thing was cool, I thought. I thought um, it was a little like strange you... to have Ivy as a character, to actually name her and then kill her off within five minutes. That was a little weird to me, like... <laughs> Why, yeah, why, would you, like why would you do that to one of your, I mean, you know, obviously it's, it's, it's got to be that way to, to be a Jack the Ripper story, but it seemed really strange to have Ivy as that person who is murdered right away. I like the expanded roles that they gave to Selena Kyle and Harvey Dent. That added a lot to it. Having Selena Kyle as sort of this, um, as the person who sort of spurs people on towards paying attention to what's going on 
with these folks from uh, from you know the the lower class who everybody else is ignoring in favor of this you know turn of the century Gotham fair. It's kind of interesting. Yeah, and whoever wrote this definitely understood Selena Kyle and Harvey Dent. They played inter- integral role in this story, and I, I really like how they were used. I like Selena's wardrobe as yeah, well. Yeah, I really uh, they really captured their love element. I thought without being over the top and in your face with yeah, it. Yeah, uh, this was a very strong, very strong Selena Kyle story. Um. All right, Jerry, I'm going to need to wrap up this edition of the Confirmed Epic Podcast. I wanted to give you uh, a couple minutes, though, or so. Is there anything else you want to say before we uh, give our rating and wrap this edition of the pod up? About Gotham by Gaslight. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Um, Again, I I think without... Maybe this movie, you know, sometimes when there's a big change in a movie, I, I try to think about why would a movie, like, why would you take the story that's in Gotham by Gaslight and do something completely different with it? For one, I mean, maybe they wanted to do something that was unique and new to fans so that people didn't already know who the killer was. That's entirely possible. Number two, Gotham by Gaslight is a pretty short story. I mean, it's not long. There's a lot of scenes that are just reading over letters. So maybe they thought they were going to have to add a lot of stuff to expand it anyway. But I still feel that they they neglected some of the things in this movie that made the original story fascinating. The fact that you know Jack the Ripper comes over about the same time as Batman. That adds an interesting air of suspicion that this movie did not. You know, having those things kind of connect simultaneously. That was an interesting aspect of things. Um, I really thought, I, I really thought it was going to be Harvey Dent up until we saw Barbara Gordon, uh, Jim's wife, not his daughter in this one, reveal her face that, that Gordon had burned her. I thought the his motivations for me were really strange. Um I felt really weird about having Gordon as a villain because he's always like the incorruptible character. You know, he's always the character that you expect um, that you can depend on. He's always the character. It seems like he's going to do the right thing. So I did feel really strange about and a little angry that they chose Gordon uh, as, as Jack the Ripper um, Harvey Dent would have made more sense. This felt like it was done just for shock value. I, I could see that. Even his, even his, the reasoning he gives seems like it would have made way more sense coming out of Harvey Dent's mouth, or or even Bullock's mouth, than it did coming from Jim Gordon's mouth. Still, this is a pretty cool movie. I enjoyed it. Um, it it doesn't do as much interesting, in depth. Uh, look at like sort of what's going on as the graphic novel does but it has some good set pieces it has some fun references dr hugo strange shows up you know the robins pamela isley there there are some uh cool little easter eggs there i would probably give this a good and a half if i were if i were rating it i'm gonna give it a good i think if you're a like I said, a more diehard Batman fan, you're going to get a lot of the references, a lot of the character uses, a lot of the world building they do different than the graphic novel. But even though the graphic novel is um, maybe a shorter, still more dense, I think there's a there's a lot more, and dense in a good way. Like there's a lot more to the graphic novel, as you have very very eloquently stated uh, throughout the course of this podcast. I'm going to go with a good, if you're a diehard DC or Batman fan, pick this up, add it to your collection. If not, just wait to hit uh, Netflix. So I confirm Batman Gotham by Gaslight, a good Jerry as a good and a half. Jerry, uh, this is going to wrap up the 84th edition of the Confirmed Epic Podcast. Where can people find more of you on the internet this week? Keep checking out my site, www.actionfigurebarbecue.com, serving up toy reviews hot and fresh daily. Uh, Stay tuned. Next week, we're going to spend most of the show recapping New York Toy Fair 2018 with the 
uh, site runner of actionfigurebarbecue.com himself, Jerry Reed. We've done this before. Those are always very, very fun shows. Uh, a lot of Mesco 112 talk is in our future, Absolutely. I imagine. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at the real Brad Bell, D R E E L Brad Bell. Find me at Geeks Worldwide, D G W W dot com. Just wrote up that Wolverine four four issue mini series. You can check out uh, that there. Of course, you can find me at the Epic Review, T H Epic Review dot com. Follow us on Instagram at Confirmed Epic Podcast. Don't forget the Geeks Worldwide T shirts are dropping this Friday. They'll be on sale for fourteen dollars and. Uh, the last few days of February, T Public's having a big sale on all the shirts. All the shirts will be thirteen to fourteen bucks. That's tpublic.com slash user slash the real Brad Bell. Jerry, we had just enough gas to get through this edition of the Confirmed Epic Podcast. Thank you so much for joining me tonight, my friend. Glad to do it. And once again from the Hollywood foothills of North Carolina, we are out. That's all I have to say about that. This has been a production of the GWW Radio Network. Please don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review us on iTunes, Stitcher, and SoundCloud. Also, check out Geeks Worldwide at thegww.com for all the latest news, reviews, and opinions on video games, comics, movies, TV, cosplay, and more. Geeks Assemble! From the Hollywood foothills of North Carolina, I'm the real Brad Bell, coming at you with our very first merch pitch, which is going to be our three inaugural t-shirts celebrating over four and a half years of the EpicReview.com, THEpicReview.com, and the official podcast of the EpicReview.com, the Confirmed Epic Podcast. You're going to be able to find all of these shirts at tpublic.com slash user slash the real Brad Bell. The R E E L Brad Bell. First shirt I want to show off is the Confirmed Epic Podcast logo t shirt. Here's why I love this design and this shirt so much because it shows off what we talk about most, what we love most on the Confirmed Epic Podcast, which is comics and film. And specifically, this also relates to comic book movies as well, as we have the word bubbles encapsulated in the splice of film. So show off to your friends your love for film, your love for comics, and your love for the Confirmed Epic Podcast in our very first logo tee. Our second shirt revolves around a blunder slash inside joke that has become a staple of not only the Confirmed Epic Podcast, but our brand as a whole. And that is THEpicReview.com and our THEpicReview.com tee. What well, started as a mistake by myself by only including one E in our URL, theepicreview.com, has now become not only an inside joke, but a calling card of myself, aka Andrew Stokes and Jerry Barbecue 17 Reed. Now you can let all your friends and family members in on that joke, as well as inform them of one of the best entertainment blogs on the internet with the epicreview.com that's the th epicreview.com t-shirt last but not least we have my favorite design of the three and that is the thank you bob reed t-shirt way back when jerry barbecue 17 and i as well as aka andrew stokes had a dream of starting an entertainment blog we realized it was going to be a lot of work and it was going to cost a decent chunk of change so when nobody else believed in us the man that gave us barbecue 17 jerry barbecue 17 reed also funded the upstart of the epicreview.com as well as the confirmed epic podcast in order to get us on the airwaves 
and we now want to thank him and celebrate that man, the one, the only Bob Reed with this badass Thank You Bob Reed t-shirt. What you have here is the most epic photograph we could find of the father of Barbecue 17, Bob Reed. Now you can show off your love for the man that if it were not for him, there would be no TheEpicReview.com or The Confirmed Epic Podcast. So get your Thank You Bob Reed t-shirt today. You can find all of these shirts at tpublic.com slash user slash the real Brad Bell. The R-E-E-L Brad Bell. We're going to be giving away one of each of these t-shirts on the Confirmed Epic Podcast. So make sure you stay tuned for that. But in the meantime, head over to tpublic.com slash user slash the real Brad Bell. The R-E-E real Brad Bell right now so that you can have the most confirmed epic wardrobe of all of your friends.